Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lori Bambaco. I'm an oncology dietitian, and I'm here inside the demo kitchen at Cancer Wellness Center where I work and get to work with individuals who are interested in pursuing nutrition as a way to help really optimize their well being, both mind and body. And it's such a pleasure to be able to do that as well as programs like this one that you're attending or watching right now. It's called Ask the Dietitian, and this is part two of our very popular hot topic. So it's a continuation of our Ask the Dietitian from February. It's all about plant-based meat alternatives. If you had a chance to attend the Ask the Dietitian in February, thank you. If you did not, guess what? You can watch it. It was recorded and it is on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to Cancer Wellness Center and uh, click on uh, that video, you get to see exactly what I presented during February. Now it's such a hot topic that I didn't have enough time to answer all of the questions. So I will continue doing that now. And I'm gonna share my screen and share a PowerPoint that I created, which uh, gets shared with all of our participants um, after the program today. Thank you for watching and buckle up because I'm going to move through this rather quickly. So I'm going to just first start with a quick review um, of what was covered in February, just very briefly. Answer the questions that I did not get a chance to, as well as two additional questions that were submitted but, uh, since then. And then um, I always like to share as part of the Ask a Dietitian uh, program, some recipes to consider. So when you register for the program, you, I do give you access to those recipes because I think more important than just knowing this information is being able to enjoy it in your kitchen for yourself. Okay, so all about plant-based meat alternatives. So I reviewed in February that this is a huge industry right now. It's a huge market and that sales grew up to from 21% in one year from 2020 to 2021, and we're only expected to see more growth. So what I wanna do is give you some confidence that you're making the right choices for yourself. Now, uh, before there was the Impossible Burger, there was something called Protos, which is one of the earliest engineered meat alternatives. And it was right around uh, the early 1900s that came from um, this institute called the Battle Creek Sanitarium. And think about it as like a glorified medical spa. Everyone that who was anyone flocked to this uh, place in Michigan. And there was a physician there, Dr. Harvey Kellogg, as well as some of his early protégés, such as Lena Francis Cooper, who you see on the slide there. She gave birth to my profession. She was a registered dietitian and she trained nurses um, and other interested uh, clinicians in the field of nutrition. And she helped create one of our earliest engineered meat alternatives, Protos. And guess what? I have a mock recipe for you to enjoy. All right, so for those of you who uh, 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 register for the program, you will get a copy of that. So what I also pointed out in February is that I don't want you to think that just because it's an alternative to meat, that it's necessarily better or healthier, more nutritious. I wanna help you navigate that appropriately because food companies are very easily able to market their product in a way that looks more nutritious than it might really be. I also gave a quiz. So I wanted to give you three options of three categories, a burger, a cheeseburger, and a pizza. Could you tell the original from the imposter? And I, I venture to guess many of you uh, were not able to guess. They're so similar in terms of their nutrition analysis. So I wanna expand upon this concept today as well. So here were the first three questions that I did have a chance to answer in February. Which plant proteins stimulate collagen production and help build muscle? Are there any negatives to any plant proteins or combinations of them? Are there any interactions with medications? Thank you so much. And then lastly, what to start with, fresh or frozen? These, were, these are the questions I will answer today. What can I do to ensure I am getting healthy proteins while on a vegetarian diet during chemo? Are there any foods I should avoid? I heard and read positives and negatives about soy. What does research tell us? Very popular question that I get to answer regularly. Your feelings about the entire impossible line of meat substitutes. 
I'm glad that was asked because I have feelings. <laughs> Uh, the, sev the seventh question in total, healthier options for plant brand of plant proteins, and do plant proteins meet the daily requirements as well as animal proteins? Great questions. So here was that first question, which, which plant proteins stimulate collagen production and help build muscle? Well, the bottom line that I provided to you is that we don't really want to rely on collagen first and foremost to build muscle. The way that we build muscle is by eating an adequate diet which a dietitian can make sure is happening for you. And then also to use the muscle. That's how we build muscle. So if you're interested to learn more about that, maybe that's another Ask the Dietitian topic. My thing. And I also have recorded a video um, for the Cancer Wellness Center in early January. So it's on the YouTube channel if you're interested to learn more about that. Um, but if you are someone who's interested in collagen for other reasons, and you want to take one, I would encourage you to ask your, your healthcare provider, but they generally seem to be safe at this point in time. The research that supports the use of collagen supplements is really for things like arthritis of the joints, and then also too for skin elasticity. So if you have aging skin, there is some research that suggests collagen may be helpful, but that research is funded by the industry, the people that make collagen. So that may introduce some bias, right? We want to keep that in mind. So if you're looking to stimulate collagen or build collagen, we just want to, again, make sure that you're eating enough in the diet. Our bodies make collagen just fine. So we probably do not need to take any extra in a supplement or with food forms, okay? But we want to make sure we are eating adequately. So that would mean we're eating enough protein from both plant and animal sources, as well as the mineral zinc and vitamin C. They're all important for building collagen. The next question. Were there any negatives to any plant proteins or combinations of them? Are there any interactions with any medications? Good question. So here's the bottom line about that, those questions. I don't think there are any potential negative implications. Um, if we're nutritionally compromised, we may want to reconsider strictly plant-based proteins, and I'm going to explain that. Um, if we're not eating well, if we're eating the same thing day in and day out, we may become deficient or inadequate in some other valuable nutrients that are found in animal proteins. The strictest of all plant-based diets, which is vegan, it can supply all, everything we need from the diet. It's very possible, and I help individuals navigate that. There are no contraindications with prescriptions. Ex the exception, though, is the group of MAOIs monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So procarbazine is actually a chemotherapy that is used in oncology. And in this situation, which I have worked with individuals where this is the case, what we do is we make sure that the plant proteins they're eating is in the right amounts because there is a plant protein, um, an amino acid, tyramine, that is high in some of our plant proteins. And we wanna make sure they're not eating too much of this tyramine. Okay, so those are really the only exceptions. And if you don't fall under this category, I want you to enjoy all the plant protein your heart desires. Okay, okay. The, la the third question from February, what to start with, fresh or frozen? What a great question. Not easy to answer. So I wanted to kind of give you just an overall review of that. And what I did is I went through each of these items on the checklist. Do you care about your salt intake? You might. And so if you do, then you just wanna check labels and make the best decision for you. Do you care about your fat quality? You probably do. So again, you're gonna check labels. Do you care about the ingredient list? So if it's highly processed, chances are the more the ingredients, the more processed the product is. So we can find that also on a label. Do you need extra protein? Maybe because of your circumstances or maybe because you're just not eating a lot of protein otherwise throughout the day. And so you want to find it in a plant-based alternative, then you're going to read labels for that as well. I want you to follow your taste buds. Okay. So if you find products that you do like, I think that's a really important component to eating the foods that we eat, right? We got to like the way they taste. And then also keep in mind, if you just make this decision on, okay, I'm going to choose this product. It's only one food choice. It's only one choice out of so many that you make that day as well as the rest of the week. So we wanna kind of put it into context and that helps us understand really best how well we're doing in pursuit of our nutrition goals. Okay, 
So now we're gonna move on to those new questions. What can I do to ensure I am getting healthy proteins while on a vegetarian diet during chemo? Are there any foods that I should avoid? So if you are on chemotherapy and you're vegan, remember like, so this is the most strict you could possibly be with plant proteins. How do we make sure you're eating enough? Well, this is good information for anyone, regardless if you're vegan or not, regardless if you're on chemotherapy or not. The way we define or determine how much protein you need every day, it's really an estimate and it's based on your weight and also any medical indications, right? So sometimes people that have kidney disease or really like end stage liver disease, we may restrict protein. Otherwise we, we use this formula. So what we do is we take about one to 1.2 grams of protein for every kilogram that you weigh. That's how we do it, it's an estimate. So we may play around with those numbers a little bit um, using our judgment. That's what a dietitian is good for. So here's an example. So there are 2.2 pounds in every one kilogram. So let's say someone weighed 150 pounds, they weigh 68.1 kilograms. So a lot of people like to report their weight in kilograms, <laughs> just as an aside, good to know, right? So let's multiply it in that range. It's gonna be about 68, right? Up to 81 grams of protein per day. That is the requirement. Now it is very possible to meet all of your nutrition needs on a vegan diet. I mentioned that earlier, and certainly that's the case for protein. So here's an example of how to do that in a day to meet 80 grams of protein if you're vegan. This would be breakfast, this would be lunch, maybe dinner, this would be lunch or dinner. Really straightforward, easy, not a ton of food, right? Here are some snacks and it's intentional. So there are some choices here, like beans and soy milk and edamame, you see. Um, the smoothie is made with a dairy alternative that is high in protein. We got, what else we got in there? Some, I said tofu earlier, probably. I just love my tofu. But this all equates to 80 grams of protein. Very doable. So what in addition? Okay, so we know we can meet protein goals if you're vegan. What in addition needs to be considered? So during chemo, many individuals, actually their metabolism shifts a little bit where they lose muscle. So remember what I mentioned earlier, if we want to build muscle, we need to eat enough protein. So you may need to eat more protein during chemotherapy. Also, if you are a strict vegan, you may need to eat more protein in general, right? From even from plant foods, because the protein in plant foods, we don't absorb as well. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more in a moment. So we need to just probably skew a little bit higher on that estimate in terms of how much protein you need in a day. So grains are lower in lysine, and this is an essential amino acid. Beans and lentils are lower in methionine, an essential amino acid. We need to eat those two amino acids. We don't make it in the body. There's 11 of them in the body that we make on our own. Really great but nine essential amino acids are essential, meaning we need to eat them, okay? So if you're vegan and you're really only eating beans and not many grains, you may not be eating enough lysine, okay? So we wanna just make sure again, there's variety and adequacy in terms of everything you're eating. So we wanna include both of those sources of amino acids regularly. So things like nuts and seeds, and then the butter versions of them, as well as oats, and then our whole family of beans, right? As well as some of our great whole grains or pseudo grains like amaranth and quinoa and pistachios and pumpkin seeds, that will fit the bill. So if you're eating those foods regularly, you don't have to necessarily eat them every single day, but pretty often you're gonna be able to meet your needs. Now about that muscle, remember I talked about this a little bit earlier. Preliminary research suggests that plant proteins are inferior to animal proteins in their ability to make muscle. So if you are someone who has lost muscle and you are intentionally trying to rebuild, you may wanna keep this in mind. Animal proteins have been shown to stimulate muscle synthesis compared to our plant-based alternatives. That's what the research suggests at this point in time. Plant proteins, they offer an abundance of nutrients and they're so valuable as part of a healthy diet. 
but they just rank slightly lower than animal proteins with the nutrients that they possess and, uh, and actually are required to synthesize muscle. So this is actually from, this was published this year, really hot off the press information. And this shows you an example of the comparison between animal and plant proteins, what they have and what they may not have as it relates to making muscle, okay? So what you'll notice is on the left side there, animal protein supports muscle synthesis. It has the things that we need, right, in order to make that happen. Plant proteins are a little less supportive of that process. Here is another image from that same study, and you see the citation at the bottom there. So this is for individuals on treatment, right? Actual chemo, radiation, surgery, a combination of them. If you've been diagnosed and you're on curative or palliative treatment, you're on active treatment at this point in time, you need more protein. You need 1.2 to, to up to 1.5 grams per kilogram per day. And what you'll also notice is that they want us to eat most of that protein from animal sources so that we don't lose muscle. If you are not wanting to do that, that's when you need to work with a dietitian just to make sure you're getting everything you need to retain your healthy body composition. So you see that there. We just wanna really evaluate and follow closely. Is that individual able to meet their, their needs or for their goals? Now, after treatment, guess what? Those limitations go bye-bye. <laughs> so you're able to really pursue the plant-based choices that you might initially really want. So the bottom line with protein and treatment, I want you to eat, if you're on treatment, I want you to eat protein from a variety of sources that includes whole grains, sprouted whole grains, amaranth, quinoa, nuts and seeds and butter versions, lentils, tofu, tempeh. If you're not eating well and you're losing weight as well as muscle, you may want to consider including some animal foods. And again, consult with a dietitian who can help you do that. I want you to eat iron containing foods regularly from plant sources lentils, tofu, spinach, kidney beans, chickpeas, soybeans, tempeh, they fit the bill. Also include vitamin C with those choices. So red bell peppers and citrus, they rank really high in terms of the vitamin C content. And then B12. So if you're strictly vegan, it's not easy to eat enough B12. We can't rely, really vitamin B12 comes strictly from animal choices. So we look towards fortified products like breakfast cereals or fortified nutritional yeast. That might be a source of vitamin B12 for you. Now, if you don't eat those foods, you may need to be evaluated to see if you need a supplement to take. Okay, next question. I, I heard and read positives and negatives about soy. What does the research tell us? So the negatives you might have read, I'm going to say that they're myths. I'm just guessing. So there are some myths that still exist out there because it's probably dated information that you might have come across or someone who's just uninformed about what we currently know about soy. So one of those myths is that soy has isoflavones and those isoflavones act like estrogen. So why would you want a lot of estrogen in your body if you don't want it, right? Some people may not. So here's what you need to know. Soy isoflavones, they actually don't influence the action of estrogen in our body. There's like literally no connection between the two. We've discovered that. It was a myth at one point in time. They also do not serve as a source of fuel for cancer cells. So some cancer cells like estrogen and they're very greedy. That's what they want to eat is, is estrogen. If we eat soy, it does not impact those cancer cells at all. Really good to know. And I have more to share about that in a moment. Another myth that's out there that's uh, problematic, I think, or a little bit of misinformation is that soy is GMO or genetically modified. Well, according to some of our world renowned health experts like the World Health Organization, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, as well as one of my favorites, the Center for Science and the Public Interest, they all agree that the research shows that technology poses no risk at all to human health or to the environment than does conventional breeding. Now, if that still doesn't satisfy you and you still want to minimize genetically modified choices, good to know that that labeling is now out so we can make an informed decision. And there are a lot of resources to use. And I did a topic on this uh, for Ask a Dietitian.
So another reason to visit the YouTube channel. <laughs> now, most en genetically engineered soy is actually used as ingredients for ultra processed food. So most of the soy that's genetically modified or genetically engineered is soybean oil. Doesn't have any estrogens in it, by the way, or soy lecithin, same, no estrogens in either of those two. Now, if you pick up an ultra processed food, chances are you'll see that in there. So guess what? Maybe it's time to start minimizing some ultra processed foods. If you eat whole soy foods like edamame, tofu, tempeh, chances are they're actually not genetically engineered. And you can also buy organic versions of those products. So let me tell you a little bit more about soy. <laughs> it has some really, really great secrets that I wish everyone knew about. So it's time. We're going to break its silence. So there actually are some studies that suggest that regular consumption of legumes, so this includes soy, reduces the risk for colorectal prostate and breast cancer. Some research even suggests that there's greater overall survival for those that eat soy and have breast cancer. Wow. So here we are at a place where maybe we were afraid to have soy, and now we're learning that maybe it's recommended for you. Now, soy also has some ty types of fiber that are beneficial for us. Uh, viscous fiber is a fiber that forms a gel in the digestive tract, and it slows down the absorption of carbohydrates. Really interesting, right? So it helps control blood sugars and it helps to support our weight. Good to know. Soy also has fermentable fibers, and this is a type of fiber that is used by our gut microbes for food. And gut microbes produce a substance called butyrate, as well as short chain fatty acids, and they go travel throughout our body to help reduce inflammation as well as oxidative stress. Really good if we want to live a long, healthy life. We want to include fermentable fibers as well. So soy also has a package of cancer fighters, and they're called phytochemicals. So they're listed here on the slide, isoflavones, phenolic acids, lignans, phytic acid, protease inhibitors, and saponins, and they're cancer fighters. Here's how. They work on every level of the carcinogenic process, from initiation to promotion to the progression of a cancer cell. Those isoflavones do each of those actions as phytochemicals, okay? So do we wanna maybe think about having soy? Yes, it's okay to have them. You don't have to, but now you know that there really is a great package of nutrition contained within whole soy foods. Okay, next question. Your feelings about the entire impossible line of meat substitutes, what a great one. Okay, so what I want you to think about is if you start introducing alternatives, like impossible to your diet, what else are you eating with it? right? We can't just evaluate one food. We have to think about everything else we're eating or not eating. So let's say we have an impossible burger. Are we having it with some fries and soda <laughs> or a taco bowl with a plant-based alternative inside it? Is there still cheese and what's a tortilla made out of, like a refined fried flour? Is there sour cream in there? What about a breakfast sandwich alternative? Is there still cheese? Is there, is it between a a croissant or a biscuit that's high in fat and again, ultra processed really, I would say. And is there some coffee on the side with some sugar and whipped cream in it? <laughs> so these alternatives are not necessarily making the whole meal any better. All right, we wanna keep that in mind. So we wanna evaluate all the foods we're eating regularly to determine if our overall diet is nourishing. So let's think about what Impossible is made of. And I'm gonna see if I could not mess this up, but I'm gonna use my pen. So what you'll see here is that this is an, um, a highly processed ingredient, soy protein concentrate. That's the burger. This is like ground pork, I think. And then this is, uh, gosh, I think they're chicken nuggets. So we get water and then basically the soy protein concentrate. What you'll also see is this coconut oil. And I listed that earlier. If, if you wanna go back to February's Ask the Dietitian, You'll see what coconut oil is all about. Coconut oil is responsible for adding this eight grams of saturated fat, wow. Four grams here, right? A little less than the chicken nuggets because I don't, I don't see it, right? So we're getting less saturated fat. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. But we're getting, okay, great, we get the protein, right? Because of the soy protein concentrate. But, you know, look at these ingredients. I'm not sure what else we're really getting. We get additives, right? Because what Impossible is trying to do 
is mimic meat, right? So meat naturally contains B vitamins and zinc, but soy protein concentrate doesn't. So they have to add it back. All right, and so that's what's happening there. So about impossible. Mm, let's think about this. All right, so here is what we do know. We do know that diets that are high in red meat as well as processed meat, that's really a lot of what Americans eat, they are associated with risk for chronic disease, like cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, even some cancer types. Now, if we replace red meat and processed meat with whole plant foods, this is very beneficial for us. So when we replace that with beans and, and tofu, we actually benefit. And, it, and the research suggests that it reduces our risk of mortality. So dying from any cause at all. Really good to know, right? But are impossible products or any similar products on the market, are they the same as those whole plant foods? They're not. And the research is suggesting, we don't know yet because the research hasn't looked at these replacements. And you know, we, we don't know if we can compare the two yet, right? So we want to evaluate what you need and what your current choices are. If you are someone who eats a lot of red meat, a lot of processed meat, and yet impossible is a step in the right direction, this might be a good step, right? But if you're someone who will gladly start eating more beans and whole grains and nuts and seeds, these whole plant foods, then I would encourage that as a bigger step in the best direction for you, right? According to what the research shows. So let's just look at some of these comparisons. So impossible as well as some other alternatives. I would define them as ultra processed. So we get a lot of extra sodium and a lot of extra saturated fat. But even more problematic is that they don't contain these naturally occurring compounds that are cancer protective, like vitamins and minerals, phytochemicals and fiber. Yes, impossible does put back some vitamins and minerals, but they're not the naturally occurring ones. And sometimes when we eat the naturally occurring forms of these compounds, it's, it's biologically more available for our body. It's in a better package. And that's how I want you to look at that. And I did find a study that it was a metabolomics study. So they analyzed these plant-based alternatives, including Impossible and, and whole plant foods. And what they found is that the two are not interchangeable. Okay, so that just reinforces that thought that impossible is inferior to whole plant foods. All right, so in summary, we cannot assume that existing research supports the benefits of a plant based diet to automatically include these ultra processed meat alternatives like impossible. And that's what you might assume. And so I just wanna make that clear. We can't just assume that these new novel products on the market are necessarily inclusive of what the research supports that plant-based diets are really where it's at, cancer protection, as well as other chronic disease. So I'm gonna re reinforce that thought. <laughs> so we cannot assume that existing research supporting the benefits of a plant-based diet automatically includes these ultra-processed meat alternatives. Can they fit into a healthy diet? Sure. And if you know me as a dietitian, you know that I think all foods can fit technically, right? But we don't want to assume that it's necessarily a health food, which it may be sort of the reputation it has right now. I want you to think about all of your regular choices. And if impossible is a step in the right direction for you, enjoy it. Maybe not assume it's something to eat regularly, but a once in a while choice. And recognize that whole plant foods really are the ultimate goal if you're looking for the biggest bang for your buck. Okay, I think we made that one clear. <laughs> so do plant proteins meet the daily requirements as well as animal proteins? Really good question. So the protein package, I want you to aim to eat what you need as part of your total diet, right? So if you're worried that if you start substituting plant proteins for animal proteins, you, you can make up for what you might otherwise be missing, right? In other choices during the day. And it's very easy to do. I wanna give you some confidence about that. If you need reassurance, that's what I'm here for. Plant proteins have fiber, they have favorable fats. This is better, right? Than some of the animal choices. They contain antioxidants, they contain phytochemicals. Now, despite that, they, they do tend, if we're going to compare the two, they are lower in calorie. Okay, good for some of us managing our weight. They may be lower in protein, 
maybe we need to worry about that, maybe we don't. I'm gonna explain that in a moment. They are, they tend to be lower in zinc and iron and B12. Guess what? You can get enough protein. I demonstrated that. And you can get zinc, iron, and B12 from other sources. I also demonstrated that. Now the protein in plant proteins are not absorbed as well. So we do tend to need to eat more if our needs for protein are higher, okay? Most nutrition requirements can be met with plant proteins. I, I shared that earlier. So consuming a variety of choices and intentionally including foods with targeted nutrients are necessary to make that happen. And this is from the slide I shared earlier. We wanna eat a variety of plant proteins from whole grains to sprouted grains to beans and lentils. That whole family is gonna make sure we're getting the protein we need. If you're, if you're on chemo, if you're not feeling well, you're not eating well, you're losing weight, losing muscle, then you need to stop in your tracks. But if you're not, if those do not apply to you, you're okay to have the plant proteins. Now, you wanna make sure you're eating enough iron. So here's some sources listed on the slide, lentils, tofu, spinach, kidney beans, just for an example. You also wanna make sure, that this is some more sources of iron, sorry about that. So fortified breakfast cereals like Total, oatmeal, corn, chickpeas, lentils, pumpkin seeds, cashew, really high in iron. So great choices to include. And then vitamin B12. So our fortified products, fortified nutritional yeast. If you don't think you're eating enough, you can just ask your doctor. You can get evaluated and see if you need to take any more to supplement. Okay, last one. So thank you for hanging with me. What are, what are some healthier options, right? So there's lots to choose from. If we're gonna go with these alternative plant proteins, what should we choose? Well, I'm glad you asked. So here's my list. I have two slides worth of choices. So if whether it's chicken that you're looking for or meatballs or meat crumbles, here are lists of ones that are not, some of them are relatively new, but some of these have been on the market for a while. So I want you to go back, re revisit those, those options that have been around for, for a while now. Um, they're less processed and they're, they fit the bill for nutrition. Here's some additional options. So if you're looking for patties or burgers, these are all great choices as well and readily available. I think you can find them in most grocery stores. Now I recently online came across a really fun uh, company. They're based out of Canada, so we can only order online and I have yet to get my first shipment, but they're called the Very Good Butchers. And here is a label of one of their burgers um, nutritionally really looks great. I would say the exception is that it does have a little bit of sodium in it. So we want to be mindful of what else we're eating that day, but look at the ingredients. Um, this is it. This is all that's in these very good butcher products. This particular burger, wheat, gluten, onion, organic black beans, organic mushrooms, barley. Wow. I recognize those ingredients. So we know we're getting quality. So our bottom line is, and this is taken off of Harvard's website, the School for Public Health. We wanna to try to eat less red meat any way that we can, right? So sometimes that means first swapping out for some poultry or seafood. That's a step in the right direction. Then another step you could take is to consume some plant proteins and from whole plant foods, right? So beans, lentils, whole grains, nuts and seeds. Those are really the top sources. And then I would say with those whole plant foods, you could really elevate the nutrition on your plate. You're, you can focus on plant proteins for satiety. Uh, they really are satisfying. They have a great mouthfeel. Capitalize on using some great flavor that provides some umami so that you may not necessarily be missing some of the animal proteins. So why not try some of these options? Tofu, tempeh, seitan, lentils, quinoa. Seitan is wheat meat. That's what it's called. So it's made from wheat, but it's really stripped down and there's not, um, it's stripped down to its protein content. So if you have sense that you might have a uh, wheat sensitivity, seitan is not for you, but it's very high in protein and it's a great option. It's like a blank slate, kind of like tofu and tempeh. So these are the recipes that I'm sharing with those who have registered a black bean and sweet potato burger, super simple to make, it's delicious. Some tempeh bacon. And then I actually found online a recipe for protos, the original protos from the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Like if it was good enough for them in the medical spa, it's good enough for us. <laughs> so we are planning obviously in April to have another acid dietitian. We're thinking it might be um, a how-to in the kitchen. 
And this is my proposed date, April 22nd. So if you want to mark your calendars, and it's not from 1 to 2, it's 1 to 1.30. And those are some of the questions that might get answered. So I'm going to stop my share, and I thank you for staying with me a little bit over.